Week two, social and mobile marketing. This is about taking the principles of marketing, some of the basics and fundamentals that you would have picked up in week one and chapters one and two, and bring them across to a, an interactive platform, but also thinking about what are some of the limits and conditions under which you're going to find yourself operating in the social and the mobile world. So before we begin, the first caveat is social media is as limited an avenue as any other channel that you'll experience in marketing. To have an effective social media presence, you need to have a target market in mind, you need to have a marketing mix, and you need to have a reason to be engaging in online marketing. Some of the stuff you'll see around online marketing treats it like some form of magic bullets, uh, some form of unlimited but magical outcome. Fundamentally, as marketers, what we are always thinking about is how do we use this to reach an audience? So, an old familiar approach, you'll see that this is a, the chapter is taking a very strategic approach. So we think about the online presence as a strategic element. Your first thought is to go back to which of the strategies are we going to engage? Is this a growth, a maintenance, or a retreat strategy? If it's a growth strategy, are we looking for an audience we already address? Or are we looking for a new audience? Are we looking to use our social media to promote products we have? Or products we're going to develop? Now what's different about social media in that aspect as well is that we can find ourselves using multiple strategies very quickly because it's a lot easier to do virtual segmentation, digital segmentation, and particularly platforms like Facebook come with pre-segmented slices of the market. So strategy, growth, maintenance, or retreat. A social media campaign has a goal. What is it that you want to achieve? Do you want people to follow you? Are you in here as the YouTube subscriber mode? Like, follow, subscribe, hit that bell, hit that share button. Do you forget to say goodbye to people and instead say like, follow, subscribe? Do you open by conversations in real life by saying put the bell on? What is it? What's your goal? Do you want more people following you? Is the goal the social media account? Is the goal the organization? Is the goal sales? You need to have some purpose for what you're doing because that will guide why you do it. Your second thing that you're looking for here is identifying your target audience for your online campaign. Now, if your product that you sell is predominantly to people who don't care about the internet, don't have Twitter accounts, and really couldn't care about what a Facebook was, then your target audience for going online would be the people who support your primary. So they'd be the clients of your customers. For all of you who've ever run tech support for a family member, you are the client and when you Google up the results, go, okay, to solve this problem that you've created on your computer, let me check the internet. It's a client versus a customer. So identify the target audience. Who is it you're after? It may not be that you're after the target customer. You may not be after your customers. You may be wanting to work with your suppliers. You may be wanting to use the social media campaigning for positioning strategies, for dealing with stakeholders. So identify the audience. Why are you online? So step one, why are you there? Who are you talking to as your primary intended? Because of the nature of social media, people will talk to you and it's up to you how to respond as to whether to go, you're not my audience, I don't care, or you're a stakeholder, I should treat you as a stakeholder to the process and I'll deal with you as appropriate for the power, the legitimacy or the urgency that you bring through your communication. That's also particularly important if you're going to use social media as a listening platform that your strategy is maintenance of the brand, maintenance of the market share, your audience is the dissatisfied, your strategy then becomes, list, your goal becomes 
listen to and resolve problems. So your target audience is you're looking for the people who are complaining about you. All social media is campaign driven. And as with all marketing, marketing is experimental design by nature. Social media is fast paced experimental design. Test, see a response, get a reaction, document the reaction, decide what to do next. So you can test and retest, you can do A-B sampling. One of the big things you can do with social media as well is that you get real time or quasi real time statistics back. If you say something, the market doesn't like, you will know very quickly, so you have the opportunity to pivot if there is sufficient flexibility. Or you're the social media intern who on 4.45 on Friday thought they were going home and has now just ordered a, an overnight camping kit from an Amazon drone. The thing with the campaign is that it's experiment and engage, it's do and try and see how things react. You also see that one of the things with social media, social media is financially and time expensive. You need to have people. Automated systems don't cut it. Automated systems open you up to terrible, terrible moments where your keyword following system or your automated response provides a grossly inappropriate response, like thanking someone for flying your airline when they have just tweeted you to complain about their experience on flying your airline. Uh, there's been more than a few of those. Lastly, monitor and change. Now the good thing again with uh, the whole social media is there's a lot of data, a lot of statistics, a lot of real-time response. It also allows you, but that monitoring and change in real-time increases the cost, increases the difficulty, and means that the more you are being flexible in response to your audience, the more you need to have a clear view of who the desired audience is and are you staying on message for them irrespective of what's happening in terms of the other communications you're receiving. So there are a couple of uses for social media uh, in terms of the overall strategy as marketers. Listening. This is the market research, this ties back into market research, it ties into market strategy, it ties into environmental analysis. It ties into a range of aspects where the world is producing a massive amount of data and some of that data is of value to you if you've got a hypothesis or if you've got a reason to collect it. And some of that data is being directed straight at you. If you have a social media channel and you are using it for listening, you will get customer feedback, quite often customer complaint, which if you set up your system so that you can then act on it, so for example, you're at the airport, you tweet Qantas and say, hey, what's happened with my flight? If Qantas sends you an automatic thing saying, thanks for flying for Qantas, one of our operators will get back to you in the following day. Qantas is missing the opportunity. If you tweet Qantas and they're straight back to you, it's like, hey, here's the conditions. Particularly around times where there are, you know, Sydney during the summer, the airport gets shut down by thunderstorms on a regular basis. Having someone live and active listening to people talking about it and responding to it and keeping people in the loop and informed is a goal. We can make that a communications goal, make it a retain loyal customers listen, respond. Second use of social media is, uh, and the internet in general is that there's a huge amount of data out there. Not all of it's useful, but if you have a hypothesis you need to test, chances are you can find what you need in order to run your analysis. And we'll talk about more of those sorts of things when we get into market research later in the semester. The last thing for social media is the actual action to go out and do, to run campaigns, to post content and commentary to ask for feedback, to talk to people, to engage with the audience. So there's a proactive, you can go out and you can use the platform to in listen, you can use the platform to understand, and then you can use the platform to act. And I say the platform because we're talking about somewhere, the internet has some 300 plus social media networks. There's the big ones we're used to, there's the Facebook, the Twitter, there's the ones that we have but no one really understands, LinkedIn. There's the ones that we have but we've sort of, everyone knows not to read the comments, YouTube. 
then there's Reddit, and there's a whole slew of other things. Fundamentally, you're not going to be on all the platforms, you're not going to be able to operate all the platforms, you've got to pick the ones based on where you expect to find your audience, and where you're hearing your audience already. Audiences will find themselves, it's up to the company to go out, seek them out, listen to them, and then engage. So one of the things I do want to uh, mention here is that this chapter is sort of leaning towards the social media. I've been on the internet since 1993, uh, literally using a 2400 board dial-up modem. Now if none of those words made sense to you, you have lived in a blessed era of good internet. But this platform has existed in one form or another since 93 and using phrases like new media or trying to treat the internet like it's some separate isolated thing when you know, the entire planet has some degree of Wi-Fi coverage or some degree of network coverage whether everyone's got access to it is different but online and offline are much more blurred but also there's the opportunity here to use the online as leverage to think what layer of data and internet access can I put over the top of my physical face-to-face -face environment to make the face-to-face -face environment a better experience for the customer, for my customer, for my target customer. So I want to briefly mention the wheel of social, the wheel of social media engagement. The 4E model here, I want to briefly talk about a couple of the elements in here because having been on the internet for an extended period, uh, there's a couple of overall things. The idea of exciting the customer, this is, again, this idea of nobody wants to friend their toothpaste on Facebook. Why would you follow a cat food account on Twitter? And how do you feel about a brand of stationery asking you to join their LinkedIn social network. It's like, steady on Vic, you're just a pen. So this is the idea that we have to excite the customer, we have to make the customer feel valued, we have to do all these things. But at the same time, we know there's a little bit, there's a lot of traffic to be had in controversy, in hate tweets, angry retweeting, hate clicks. So is it excite or insight that they're thinking about here? Now, as a marketer, my uh, preference is for you to go for the excite because that's where value is easiest to control and retain. However, not everyone plays by my rule book. The second thing about communicating using the social media is that the offer, an offer of value is an offer that's relevant to the targeted customer. The problem we have is relevancy comes through personalization. Personalization gets really creepy really quickly. As soon as you start realizing that the conversations you've been having on one platform are starting to pop up in poorly summarized versions in your ad feed, it gets a little uncomfortable. Particularly when you realize that an in real life conversation is starting to show up in online environments. Quick asterisk. There is a thing in consumer behavior theory about relevancy and recency and recency effects where these ads could be running. Like we are exposed to a lot of media and a lot of data and it's only because that you've been having a conversation. Say you've been talking about outdoor furniture. I know, thoroughly exciting. And next thing you know, Wish is advertising on your Facebook feed a hundred different pieces of outdoor furniture. Did they eavesdrop on you? Or had they been advertising that outdoor furniture to you for the last week and you hadn't actually noticed it, but it did come up as a topic of conversation because it had been sort of filtering around in the back of the brain and now you've spoken about it, it's like, hey, yeah, I really am into patio tables you see the ad that's been there all for the last month, but it wasn't relevant to you, so it wasn't getting through your internal filter systems. 
So relevancy, there are certain levels, and we do know that uh, in the early days of Gmail, uh, the Google AdWords that would come up down the side of the page were reading the email exchanges. They were looking for keywords. Myself and uh, a friend decided we'd test this and just kept mentioning weddings and eventually I was getting bridal gown offers and they were getting marriage celibacy offers. We were successfully hacking a very primitive mid-90s system, late early 2000s, mid-90s. But we also know that Google sells keyword advertising so when you ask Google you go to Google and you ask for a keyword and you do a keyword search, the first response is going to be a sponsored response. Some days the first couple of pages of responses are sponsored responses. The fact that we've got voice-based search systems in Amazon, in Apple and in a number of others just simply indicates that there is a voice-based opportunity for a system to have exactly the same level of paid and sponsored content as we do on AdWords on Google. The thing is, as customers, we want relevancy. As marketers, we want to provide relevancy. But as customers, we get freaked out and very uncomfortable when the internet knows what we've been up to and is starting to promote us strange things in our feed. We're like, no, privacy, Privacy is something that we perceive and privacy is something, the things that we want to make public goods and things seen in public and things we want to make private goods and things only seen to ourselves. It's a subjective thing in our head, it's a positioning strategy thing in our head and sometimes the automated systems have no clue about how we're thinking and it pops up an advert and we're like, ah, awkward, I didn't want to see that. Or, hey, wait, why is that there? So exciting, being relevant, being targeted, and being super creepy. These are problems you face with the social media. Now, a couple of things we want to briefly mention on the other uh, parts of the ease here. The educating the customer. Uh, this is one of the things I use the internet for, is finding out how to use a product or looking up instructions. And things that I will absolutely endorse for you to do this semester is go to YouTube as a resource for how do I make Excel work? How do I get PowerPoint to do the trick? How do I... There's a number of people out there who have recorded videos on how to make systems do things. So if in doubt, find out. Use the internet, use the educate the customer thing for your own benefit. Product experience, this is an entire genre of wonderful that we have unboxing videos. Somebody sat down one day and said, I'm gonna record me opening a package because that's the bit I get excited about at Christmas is what's in the box. Can I share my excitement? And we've got an entire genre of film based on this now. It's awesome. Last thing on the experience of product and service, uh, again, when we start thinking about target audience, target market, this is where stakeholder-based elements of how does a product work, what are the benefits of the product, how do I get the most out of the product, can the experience by proxy. If you're watching someone else play a video game and you're enjoying it, congratulations on your value exchange, but also, isn't sport wonderful? Isn't the live theatre wonderful? Isn't watching a movie great? experience by proxy. We're not in the movie. We're not fighting someone in a boxing ring or a wrestling ring. We're watching a wrestling ring. We're watching two people compete in a sport, in wrestling, in boxing, or we're watching someone compete in a sport of video games. Experience by proxy is a great use of the internet and a great value offer and itself can be a product. Engagement Again, I want to just uh, point out here that enragement and engagement are two possible strategies. The welcome to the election season where people spending the hours because they're getting value, personally getting value from angrily leaving comments on other people's posts and other people's tweets and replying and getting into big fights on the internet because it brings them value. 
So you can engage a customer, but you can also enrage a customer. You can go for metrics by controversy. You gotta see how that fits in with your overall game plan and strategy. I don't recommend it, but it's a thing. People do it. All right, so the, the other model of the, uh, I wanna just mention out here is the wheel of social media engagement. Think about this as also a good way to consider engagement overall. Information, connection, network, dynamic, and timeliness. The, think about this in terms of marketing activity. Creating value by providing information, creating value by providing a sense of belonging, by having a connection, by being a means by which communication can take place, but also a means by which value can be transferred, transvected. Dynamic is the back and forward, so networks are two-way streets. And timeliness, one of the biggest things about any of these engagement aspects is right place, right time. You know, check your drafts, your Twitter or your Facebook drafts and see how timeliness is critical in social media. Particularly when the meme's more than 20 minutes old, it's like, oh, seen that it's old this is why it's really hard to use memetic references in a video that's going to be up on the internet for several years a couple of other concepts we want to raise about uh, social media first thing is if they're like that on the internet they're like that in real life segmentation targeting positioning matter people are people on screen some people find the liberation of knowing that they won't be punched in the face immediately for what they've said to be an excuse to be who they would like to be if they thought their face was punch proof the audience on the screen is also the audience who's on the couch who's going to be at the supermarket people are on the internet and segmentation targeting positioning matters if you wouldn't position your product to address an audience of angry, frothing at the mouth, wanting to complain about anything, late 50s, recently retired men who've got no time, but plenty of, dis I've got plenty of time, but nothing else on their, in their life. If you wouldn't target them, then you wouldn't target them on the internet or offline see most of the comments threads on the AFL. So your segmentation, your targeting and your positioning, they matter because the person who's at the keyboard is a real person who goes out somewhere. Now there are a lot of fake people we can produce on the internet and there's ways and means for that to take place but basically when it comes down to it is use the same toolkit, segmentation, targeting, positioning. Final theory to engage with is the old school uh, framework. This is a 96 theory, which is relevant today. We came up with some stuff very early in the history of the internet and we got it right. And the idea here is the Hoffman and Novak, possibly the most cited article in marketing's history, the ways to communicate. We can do this broadcast, one to many, and a lot of marketers like broadcast. You put a billboard up, People can say things at the billboard, but there's no expectation the billboard will talk back. Create, put the content out, put it on a medium, put it on a platform somewhere, broadcast it to the world. It has its value. Then there's the one to many to one, which is you create the content, you put it onto the medium, but the medium also can create content and put it back to you. So there's communications backwards and forwards, two-way dynamics, uh, anytime a brand tweets, uh, goes up onto Twitter and runs a couple of tweets, they're gonna get feedback. They're gonna get responses. Some of those responses they will need to deal with, some of those responses don't have any connection to them, but that's how the world works. So the one to many to one is the idea that there is now a multi-directional conversation to which you can tap in and tap and dive out. And the one to many you still can broadcast. You can still just be putting material out there. If you put a YouTube video up and close the comment section, it's one to many. If you put a YouTube video up there, not only follow the contents, listen for other people 
talking about your video, Quantum 81. And the final theory that you want to be, uh, now flow state, Hoffman and Novak measuring flow amongst web users. Flow state is also from Mihai Czech Accent Mihai. They were the originator of the concept. But for us, an interesting framework is the idea of the internet being a facilitator of flow state. The balance between the skill and the challenge. The balance between interactivity. So the greater the tele sense of presence, the telepresence, the more your attention is focused, the more likely you are to drop into flow state. Which is why you can go to Wikipedia to just check one thing for your assignment and be two hours later reading about the history of uh, weaving looms in pre-revolution Russia. Flow is a sense of continuity, it's a loss of the perception of the world around you, and it's a facet that you can use as a marketer, but it also is a challenge because when people are in flow state, they're not going to break it to stop and buy, they're going to just keep moving to the next challenge, the next thing that provides them with that uh, hit of reward for having to deal with you know, some particular small minor challenge, which is why we get stuck in flow state works with reading because you're processing, your brain's processing the information, particularly reading new content, there's that balance of skill and challenge. You're having to imagine the concepts, you're having to think through the concepts. If the skill level is too, if your skill level doesn't match the challenge, if it's well higher, you'll get bored. If it's well lower, you'll get frustrated. So flow can be moderated in those areas. But fundamentally, this framework, these two frameworks, the many to one, one to many, many to one, and flow state are mid 90s frameworks that describe our user experience today. So there's a lot of older and old school materials that have been used as the building blocks upon which a lot of our contemporary social media experiences have been based and built. So a quick recap, social media, it's a marketing platform. It comes with marketing requirements that you have a segment, a target, a position. You still gotta have a strategy, you gotta have a reason to be there and there are some challenges to social media in terms of speed that are also benefits. You can do things in real time, but you need to have a strategy and a goal and a rationale for why you're there in the first place. So you've got a focal point that if you're gonna react in real time to challenges on social media, you know why you're reacting and how you should react. So always have a target end game, always have a target goal in mind.